And our opponents would have us believe that all problems can be solved by state intervention. But government should not run business. Indeed, the weakness of the case for state ownership has become all too apparent. For state planners do not have to suffer the consequences of their mistakes. It's the taxpayers who have to pick up the bill. I will tell him, there's nothing whatever wrong with choice and diversity. They are central to conservative policies and they are precisely what Britain wants and needs. And enterprise and opportunity have become dirty words in the Labour Party because the opposition has allowed socialist ideology to blot out both common sense and the economic realities of life. He then pointed out that there were times when Britain was isolated in her arguments. Yes, we were isolated in the European community when we tried to get a fair deal for Britain for the budget. And we stayed isolated. And we stayed isolated until we succeeded and got the fair deal which eluded the Labour government. Yes, we were isolated when we tried to reform the common agricultural policy. And eventually we got the reform of the common agricultural policy. Yes, we were isolated when they wanted a common withholding tax. And we went on and with, with our arguments and eventually we won. What he calls isolation is really leadership and winning your arguments. It is a custom that the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, has the privilege of being the first to congratulate the mover and seconder of the humble address. But of course, he added a somewhat miscellaneous collection of things uh, to that duty. It was, I might say, so very difficult to follow him through this grasshopper collection. But I notice, I notice, I refer to just uh, one or two things. He referred to capital reconstruction of steel. Mr. Speaker, the great tragedy was that steel was ever renationalized. It would probably be in very much shape if it hadn't been. He referred to, or rather he didn't refer to, the restrictive practices in the print industry. Which I would have known something about. He kept reading references from the Times, scarcely conscious that the Times is under threat because of restrictive practices. Talking nonsense. He knows that community care has not been abandoned, but that certain parts of it are being implemented already through the local authorities, and that others will be implemented when the local authorities are fully ready, in fact, to take over those very great responsibilities. What about the money? The honourable members opposite are in no condition to talk about money. They waste it time and time again. They do not know how to conduct the, the finances of the nation. As I indicated earlier, in one year it got so bad that they borrowed what today would be the equivalent of £50 billion. Of course they don't mind handing over power to other people. They handed it over to the IMF. They had to. They couldn't run it themselves. Now, Mr. Now, Mr. Speaker. The uh, right honourable gentleman seemed to avoid rather a lot in the Queen's speech, particularly those things referring to foreign affairs. He mentioned uh, arms control cursorily in passing. He did not mention his party's policy on it, and he scarcely referred to Europe. In view of his views, that perhaps is not surprising. But I'll tell you this, that man is going to trip over his promises in the rush if he's not careful. <clears throat> There's his promise, for example, not to cut taxes for many years to come. That's the one Labour promise it's safe to believe. Indeed, the Labour leader was being unduly modest. He wouldn't cut taxes ever. Why? Because he's a socialist and they just don't like the idea. In government, they put taxes up and in opposition, they fight our proposals to bring taxes down. And taxes would go up and up if Labour spends as much of your money as they've promised. But, they say, we reform characters. Next time it will be different. We've paid our debt to society. <laughs> if that were true, it would be the first ever debt Labour has ever paid. <laughs> No one could or should deny his antagonism to Britain's membership of the European community. He was remorseless in his efforts to prevent us joining the six. 
but he was content to play a prominent role. I'd much rather, as a matter of fact, but the Honourable Gentleman will call me to order if I do. But he was content. The European community has mentioned in the gracious speech and this government's commitment to it. The right Honourable Gentleman was remorseless in his efforts to present, prevent us joining the six. But he was content to play a prominent role in administration which endorsed and continued our membership of the community. The trouble with the right honourable gentleman is he tends to forget not only what he said, but when it is convenient what he did himself in the last Labour government. Well, I've been through it, and I've counted at least 47 new ways of controlling and confining Britain within a socialist state. Controlling us, just listen to some of the things they're planning to do. There's a section in here which would enable them to take over any company in Britain at any time, either permanently or temporarily, if they so choose. There's a section which says, and if the banks don't cooperate, any bank which refused to do what they wanted with your money, they'd be nationalized too. There's a section, oh yes, there's a section which goes on to say it's going to close down private employment agencies, although they find and provide the jobs. And also there's another section. There's a section which talks about stopping your right to buy your council house. I'll tell you something else. They don't even stop at your front door. Listen to this. <laughs> Men and women should be able to share the rights and responsibilities of paid employment and domestic activities. So the job segregation within and outside the home is broken down. <laughs> They're going to see if Dennis does his share of the washing up. 